so first of all, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for being here, particularly uh, on a day with, with the weather like, um, like it is. Um, thank you for investing a couple of hours of your time with us, and hopefully we'll make uh, it worth your while. Uh, the idea is to make this as interactive as possible um, and for us to keep on looking right and left, right and left in, in this manner. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so there's a microphone at each of your seats and so we'll open it up as quickly as possible. Um, quick, uh, quickly about myself. So my name is Lutfi Siddiqui. I'm a visiting professor in practice here at LSE Ideas uh, and I'm also a member of the advisory board of the Systemic Risk Center. Um, I should add that LSE Ideas has just been uh, named the number one university affiliated think tank in the world. Uh, so I'm uh, obliged to mention that. Uh, I did say number one, right? So that's... Uh... <laughs> so today's panel, uh, this event asks the question as to whether the private sector can rise to the challenge of meeting the 2030 UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we're almost five years into the 15-year trek into, uh, towards the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and the role of business in delivering social outcomes is very much on the spotlight. What's also happened in recent months is that this, the buzzword, stakeholder capitalism, has taken hold, uh, hopefully a bit of a bandwagon, and uh, so that has also intensified focus on uh, the role of business in delivering social outcomes. What we also had uh, towards the middle of last year is the Business Roundtable in the US uh, issuing a groundbreaking declaration that says that uh, it's no longer shareholder primacy, that it's no longer just a case of the business of business is business, that we need to look at uh, wider stakeholder considerations. And about a month later, when the UN General Assembly met, uh, I watched uh, Peter and Accenture. Uh, they have uh, they've been working with the UN for some time to come up with the world's largest CEO study, which is an appraisal, in a way a self-appraisal, of how businesses are doing in terms of execution against the SDGs. So we thought uh, uh, it might be a good point to try and take stock of how things are going. Uh, what is the state of play? Are businesses on track to deliver on, on their side of the bargain? Uh, if not, why not? What are the shortcomings? What are the pitfalls? Uh, can businesses really rise up to the challenge? So that's the idea. I would also hope that today we'll take a very um, positive and, and constructive bent. So on a topic like this, it's very easy to go into a winch fest uh, very, very quickly. So my appeal to you would be that uh, let's try and keep things um, with the idea that how do we take things forward. So every time we feel like whinging, let's try and rephrase it as what it should look like in our ideal world. Uh, and, and so, as I said, let's keep it as positive and uh, constructive as possible. So let's move straight to uh, our distinguished speakers. It, it really is, uh, I was looking at the perspective that each one of them brings to this topic. And, and each one of them could do a, a public lecture here on, on their own right. Each one uh, is a role model. And so this really is like the Avengers assembling. <laughs> and um, I think you know, each one of you should adopt a, a Marvel character <clears throat> by the end of today. I'm, I'm Nick Fury, so it uh, gives me huge delight to, to watch the, this assembly of, uh, of stars. Um, I'll introduce the speakers one by one. Before I do that, I see that um, uh, my bosses for the day, uh, Oona and uh, Dave Sutton, want me to make some housekeeping points. So, so here goes. First of all, uh, there's no scheduled fire drill. Uh, so if we hear the alarm, it's probably the real thing, so we'll need to, to leave. Secondly, the event is being filmed uh, and recorded. The video and the podcast will likely be available from our web page in the next few days, and photos will be taken. So I hope that um, that's not an issue, but uh, 
uh, that's, that's what's happening. There are feedback forms placed at the table, and uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, filling them out at some point, and uh, they give them to one of the stewards at the door as you leave, that would be great. And then lastly, there will be a, a, a drinks reception outside just afterwards, uh, so if you'd like to uh, stick around and continue the conversation over drinks, uh, that would be great. I also get a quick show of hands. How many people here are intending to ask questions before we even get into it? <laughs> right. Okay. So that's the market before trading <laughs> begins. Um, hopefully it'll, it'll go up. We have five Kindles, courtesy Peter Lacey. Um, so I was told that I should give um, a Kindle each the five best questions that are asked. The catch is that it contains Peter's new book in it, uh, <laughs> which is... There's such a thing as a free question. <laughs> which, is, which is great, obviously. All right, so let me introduce uh, Peter Lacey. Um, Peter is a senior partner at Accenture. He leads the UK and Ireland practice and the global sustainability practice. And also, uh, he leads the firm's partnerships with organizations such as the World Economic Forum and uh, the United Nations. Um, when I first met him and, uh, and Lucy, his wife, they lived in Shanghai. And uh, Peter was, actually, you were running the global sustainability practice from Shanghai at the time, in addition to heading up cross-industry strategy for Asia Pacific. And in 2017, Peter became uh, the youngest ever senior managing director at Accenture and a member of Accenture's Global Leadership Council. So without further ado, Peter Lacey, ladies and gentlemen. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. This is my first ever session in the LSE format, I'm told this is, and I'm parliamentary or, or LSE, but um, great to have a chance to talk to you all. Thank you for making time this evening. Uh, I hope we're in for a, an engaging dialogue. I wanted to stay extremely task-focused to tee up the conversation this evening and to answer the question straight off the bat, which is uh, the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, can businesses rise to the challenge? And the answer is yes but they have not to date. And I want to give you a few thoughts on why that may be about to change and how we go, to use your point about constructive narratives, about how we go about accelerating both the scale and the speed of that change at the importance of what I think will be one of the most important 10 years for humanity that we've seen in recent centuries. So that's the first bit. What I will say, basically, in essence, that's the short version. I have been working on sustainability now for around 20 years in different formats. Um, like some of the others in the audience, I've spanned boundaries. I've worked on the NGO side, I've worked on policy side, uh, I've worked in consulting and in business. And although I'm a pretty classically trained strategist by background, uh, I've always felt that the most interesting dynamic for society as a whole is this relationship between business and society. And I would have said up until this year, up until even January, if you'd have asked me, will we make material progress in the next decade towards the global goals, I would have given you a pretty cautious and probably pretty pessimistic view. And in the last six to eight weeks alone, I think something has happened and something is changing. And, and I've said that, I've been very public about that. Uh, and I'll tell you what I think it is. I think that there is a growing realization, not just perhaps in leadership um, roles in businesses that were already very positive about sustainability, uh, but actually I think it's starting to move further into the mainstream in different sectors, even in the last few weeks and months, I would argue. And it really hit me at Davos this year. As, as Lutfi mentioned, 
I look after our World Economic Forum relationship, and I've been going now for more than a decade uh, to Davos, and you know, Davos is not everyone's cup of tea, but it is one of the places that everyone comes together, or at least a very large number of heads of state and business leaders come together at the beginning of the year to look at what the next 12 months might bring, but also to discuss some of the bigger, more systematic and systemic issues that, that face business, that face the global economy, that face policymakers around the world. This year, it was a very different discussion than I've ever witnessed before. And I think I would describe it as a growing realization that this is the decade to deliver. The decade to deliver. And, and I would say that that is against the backdrop, and I'll tell you what I mean by the decade to deliver in a minute. But I would say that that is against the backdrop of some really quite important symbolism. But I think symbolism does matter a lot to our narratives, um, particularly narratives of the nature that we're talking about here in terms of sustainability. So what are some of those? The United Nations was 75, or will be 75 this year. The World Economic Forum itself will be 50 this year. Um, two different pillars of a global order, a multilateral global order that emerged after the Second World War, uh, and I think actually that are very much under threat, that are seeing a huge backlash in many different ways uh, against the impact that they've had and against the, the, the results that have been delivered through that order over the last 60, 70, 80 years. And I think that is also against the backdrop of that 10-year story of what we're going to be looking for in 2030 by way of sustainable development. So I think it was a pause for thought for a lot of business leaders at Davos and at the beginning of the year to step back and think about this next decade. When I talk about the decade to deliver, I think I mean three things. One is that I think increasingly my clients, who are mostly CEOs of big Fortune 500, global 2,000 clients, um, companies, uh, they talk about, and I think they increasingly recognize, that the system we have, globalization and capitalism at the moment, uh, is really fragile. And we see that in terms of the political backlash that we've seen with Trump, with Brexit, see it in Italy, we see it even in places like China where they're under incredible pressure to deliver in terms of capitalism, the jobs, the growth, the stability of the system. And we see that if we look back over the last 40 years, this is a system that has delivered for the few, not the many. And we can see that across the board in terms of um, the average uh, wages increases, we see it in terms of the quality of jobs, we see it in terms of this strong sense that there has been a polarizing effect and an asymmetry of benefits in the system that we've chosen to pursue. And business can only thrive if it's thriving in a global system that is also thriving, or thriving in markets and in countries that are also thriving. And I think that is really beginning to be something that becomes at the forefront, not at the back of the minds of CEOs. Because this last five years has been pretty turbulent. It's been pretty aggressively turbulent on lots of different levels. Now, you can say, well, look, is that something that's coming from a morality perspective, from a values perspective? In some cases, yes. In others, the kinds of transitions and the kinds of dynamics emerging in things like global trade, in flows of migration and people around the world, even if you just take that as a pure economics issue, a pure business issue, it is starting to undermine the way this system works. And it needs to be resolved and it needs to be evolved to improve. So that's the first decade to deliver theme, is to deliver a model of globalization and capitalism that actually is sustainable. I think the second uh, version of that story is a decade to deliver on technology. And we've talked a lot over the last decade about the fourth industrial revolution. You know, there's been all sorts of conversations about the physical, biological, digital technologies that are emerging. Everything from artificial intelligence to um, decoding the human genome and how those technologies hold enormous promise <coughs> for creating new forms of value for people, health, education, uh, productivity, labor, wage increases. Now, the truth is, that hasn't been the case. There has not been a fourth industrial revolution in the last decade. Now, if you just look at the absolute basic economics of what we've been going through, you know, chugging along at 3%, 4% global growth, a revolution, an industrial revolution, changes the nature of the economy, <coughs> changes the productive capacity of an economy. We have not seen that. 
So technology and the promise of technology has not delivered. Neither has it delivered for the many rather than the few. If you look at the extraordinary concentration of wealth over that period of time, it is to very few technology players, software players, platform players, the likes of the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks. You know, and actually what we see is even in businesses, most of the value is accrued to a small number of players, let alone in society as a whole. I believe personally that there is the potential for the fourth industrial revolution. I think we can see the technologies and the combinations that will allow us to enter a new era through those technologies. But this decade now has to be the decade where that becomes a reality. And we really do see a fourth industrial revolution. And that industrial revolution is put to use in a way that benefits the many, not the few. And then we come to the third component of the decade to deliver, which is that we must deliver the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the global goals, our global goals. 17 goals, 163 sub-targets that were signed up to four years ago by 192 governments around the world in probably one of the most extensive stakeholder consultations with business that we've seen from the UN process that map out a pathway to what we need to do to achieve a turnaround in sustainable development. And when you look at that and take another step back, you realise that business has to be at the heart of that. If it isn't at the heart of that, there is zero chance of us achieving it. So I'll give you a few statistics I was with the CEO of um, Bank of America recently, Brian Moynihan, uh, who talks, I'm sure Julie probably has similar figures, um, well, who talks about the fact that every year to 2030 to deliver the UN Sustainable Development Goals, we will need to invest $6 trillion globally. Right? And at the moment, if you add up what's committed from government spending and from philanthropic and charitable spending, you get to about $1.4 trillion. So even at the beginning of the decade, we're $4.5 trillion light in terms of the investments that are required in infrastructure, in transformations in energy, in material sciences, to deliver this, the sustainable development goals. Now, on the one hand, you say, well, that is a massive systemic failure. And on the one hand, it is. But also, the way I look at it is, it is an enormous opportunity for capital markets and for business to provide the products and the services and the new innovations and business models that allow us to bridge that gap. And by the way, that is not to deny the need for regulation or policy because we can accelerate those areas with things like having carbon pricing through tax, through cap and trade, and we can stimulate the market in different ways to achieve that. But somewhere we've got to get from 1.4 trillion to 6 trillion. And also all of you know the way that that economics and investment work, we can't afford to be behind in the first five years and try and play catch up in the second. You know, that, that is just a, a fact that we know we'll need to be seeing businesses step up right across the world. Now, here's the bad news. Maybe that wasn't bad enough news. I've not been very constructive and positive, have I? But we'll lay this out. Right? The bad news is we are off on every single one bar two of the SDGs as we start the decade. Maternal health and in some, some form economic well-being. And every other example ha is off track. The UN Secretary General um, says that as we carry on at this current trajectory, that we will achieve only 50% of the sustainable development goals. Even factoring in the investments that are included and that have already been committed, we will only achieve 50%. <clears throat> and you only have to see, I think, what's going on increasingly in places around the world whether you see the wildfires in California, you see Australia, we're getting to points and tipping points and planetary boundaries where you know, this is becoming irreversible and becoming very, very existentially frightening for a lot of people. Um, and the best of the science tells us we simply can't afford not to deliver on that kind of trajectory on some of those goals over the next 10 years. So that's my starting point. And I believe, and I've seen this myself, um, I'll give an example for Julie would be, I've had... Since Davos, I have had five times more spanking CEOs call me this month than three months ago. All right? And if you look across the board, the, the demand to want to have proper conversations at the beginning of this year is four, five, maybe even ten times more than we've seen before. 
Now, that doesn't mean it's necessarily converting into action. I'm not going to say that that means that we are seeing a C-shift yet, because that has to be measured in results. But it seems something is changing. Now, when we talk about the CEO study that Lutfi mentioned, which uh, we've got a few copies of, I think. Um, if, you know, for those of you, there's a box here with, um, with, with some copies. There's half a dozen copies here. But you can, you can get it online. This is the result of a project that I've done now for um, 15 years for each of the last three UN Secretary Generals. Um, firstly for Kofi Annan, um, then for Ban Ki-moon, and now more recently for Gutierrez. And the study aims to give the UN leadership a chance to, every three years, take the temperature, um, almost a weather vane, if you like, for what business leaders are talking about, what they're focused on, what they think are the challenges, what are the opportunities, to enable the UN system to better work with business on some of these challenges. And this, um, this time round, which we presented this, as you rightly said, in the uh, Climate Week in the UN in September of last year, uh, we had the largest sample size to date. So we had 1,000 CEOs um, from more than 20 industries uh, from nearly 100 countries around the world. And I will just give you a couple of insights as to why I think it's changed and why we've still got plenty of challenges ahead and tee that up for the, for the conversation in the group. This CEO study was very interesting for me. Three points. One, for the first time, I saw a deep self-reflection from CEOs that they weren't delivering on the sustainable development agenda, um, described by themselves rather than described by others. So out of those 1,000 CEOs, only 21% of those CEOs told us that they thought that they were having a material and critical positive impact on sustainable development through their core business. So four-fifths said that their business was not making the progress that they should be making on sustainable development. And that's not us saying that, that's them saying that. So four-fifths uh, of... Are you, you mean, you're pointing at me to do something or her to do something? <laughs> right, okay. um, four-fifths of CEOs don't believe that they're doing enough. Right? Now... The second thing is, though, that's interesting is they believe they have enough firepower, enough tools at hand to deliver against this agenda. So if you ask them, do you believe that you need new technologies that don't exist? Do you need new business models that don't exist? Do you need something somehow that, that we need to reinvent? They will say no. They will say they don't have the right regulatory and policy frameworks in place. They will say that they have competing strategic priorities. They will say that they have different demands from different shareholders, some of whom will say with one voice that they want them to push very hard on sustainability, and others who will say, yes, but not if it costs more. Right? And there are lots of other tensions in the system. But the good news is that 40% of those CEOs told us they're already driving revenue growth out of sustainability. 35% told us that they're already better able to manage their cost base through driving down emissions, driving down energy use, water waste, through building trust. 72% of CEOs told us that trust was the critical driver for them, and building trust with societies to be able to innovate together, um, to have the license to operate, to license to grow. Um, and so I think one positive thing to take away is that a lot of companies are already making a very good fist of this. And a lot of CEOs believe all of the different pieces of the jigsaw are there, but we're not putting it together in the right way. And we're certainly not putting it together in the right way at the right speed that matches the scale of the challenges. And then the third thing I'll leave you with is, and it comes back full circle, if you like, to the technology conversation is, most CEOs feel very nervous about the next three to five years because of the political uncertainty that exists at a global level that will either, that may well inhibit our ability to mobilize at scale uh, in the ways that we might want to around sustainable development. Uh, so 63% of CEOs, the highest number we've ever had, said that political uncertainty was their greatest challenge and their greatest concern. Uh, the next highest was 55%, which was short-term shareholders driving extreme cost consciousness within markets. Um, that was the second. And, and I think that's an interesting point. And it was juxtaposed with a lot of the conversations we have with CEOs 
who felt that the only scale of investment that is on the, on the horizon, that's on the table in this next decade, is the investment that's already committed to fourth industrial revolution technologies. Technologies that are already engaged or that are already, in, already down on um, national investment plans, infrastructure plans, that are already on corporate plans in terms of investment in digital technologies, biological technologies, physical technologies like the shifts to clean energy. And so a lot of the conversation we had with CEOs was not about how do we find new investments to bridge that four and a half trillion gap, but how do we arc the curve of some of these existing investments that are already committed, that are already budgeted, and how do we make those drive the sustainable development agenda? And I think there's a huge sweet spot in there for business to look not only at all of the additional capital that's required, it is required, and to look at the additional regulatory frameworks and policy mechanisms that are required, but also to look at the existing trillions of dollars that are earmarked for investment in technology and to think about how we use that differently and how we use that in a smart way to also deliver the sustainable development goals. So I will stop there. The answer from me is yes, it can. It has not to date, quite clearly. Uh, I think there is reason to be optimistic and things are moving faster than we've seen before. But it is going to take something akin to a Manhattan Project, a Marshall Plan, um, you know, something of that order of magnitude of all the different elements of society working together to minimise the downside risk and to find a pathway that gets us to 2030. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind taking the middle seat. Oh, sure. So can I get a quick show of hands to how many people believe that businesses can rise to the challenge? Oh, yep. Great, so we have a bit of pre-existing optimism over here. So Peter, I'll be asking you a question later on about this phenomenon of tokenism. How do we deal with the perception? I don't know if it's a fact or not, but certainly a perception that a business can be an offender on 16 of the 17 SDGs <laughs> and then, you know, expect to be congratulated for the wonderful things they are doing on the 17th one. Uh, yeah, so uh, Catherine is CEO of uh, uh, Share Action uh, and has been for over a decade. Uh, Share Action is the UK's leading responsible investment group. Uh, there's a Financial Times article from last year in which uh, I don't know if it's the article that describes you or you've described yourself as both a gadfly and a helpmate to the global investment industry. Um, I remember that it was the, uh, what's it called, the Workplace Disclosure Initiative, Disclosure Initiative yeah, yeah. Which, is one of, which is one of the feathers and the caps of, uh, of Share Action. Uh, I also remember not too long ago, uh, you guys pointing out that BlackRock, there's a bit of a disconnect between uh, what they uh, say and what their voting records are. Uh, and at the moment, as we speak, uh, you're fighting with Barclays about something. But I'll, I'll uh, ask you to elaborate on that, please. So ladies and gentlemen, Catherine Howard. <laughs> Thank you, Lutfi. Um, excellent to be here. Excellent to be back, I should say, because I had a wonderful year being trained in many things that have helped me in my career um, here at LSE. Um, so I'm also going to start with the question, um, can businesses rise to the challenge uh, of helping the world to meet the sustainable development goals? And I, and I agree that they can, uh, but I think we also need to ask whether they will, and on that I think the, the verdict is a lot less um, clear. Um, so I would also though agree with Peter that we will absolutely not um, achieve the sustainable de development goals without harnessing the best that business can bring. So they are a necessary condition, absolutely, that we um, get business on side. And business has all the tools, has all the ideas, has the people. Um, 
to make it happen. But they, they, it's very far from clear that they will play that role. Um, and so what I thought I would just briefly highlight are what I think are some of the um, conditions which would need to be met for business to step up. And the first of those is leadership within the business sector. And I feel very encouraged after hearing what Peter said about the fact that just in the last few weeks, business leaders seem to have woken up, that um, they have a really important role to play. They're not fully um, embracing the potential to make a difference. I actually think that... Uh, on, just briefly on the whole question of leadership, we need a new generation of leadership. So I think the whole agenda around diversity and leadership is actually really instrumental and part of the conditions for success that the leadership of uh, global business looks a bit different from the, the, you know, the, the, the people that are in the uh, CEO roles uh, today. Um, and, I, and I would say that uh, corporate leaders are attuned to, listening to, maybe not perfectly, um, an up-and-coming generation within their companies and people that you know, may or may not join their company. So I think that's a really important um, factor and, and, and pressure. And I, I hear a lot of business leaders um, talking about how they're aware that you know, talent may not join their companies unless their company has a really clear story and a credible story around sustainability. So I think that whole question of um, a different and better and more attuned leadership class within the business sector. So the second... Um, oh, by the way, I'll just point to Jeff Bessos as a really interesting example, high-profile example, who, um, you know, only very recently, I think, <laughs> has discovered that uh, uh, Amazon really needs to step up uh, and has made some really quite impressive commitments in quite a short time. And I would lay um, the role that employees um, in the company has, have played in really quite an interesting example. Um, so there's been a lot of really well-documented agitation from um, employees at Amazon, um, which I think is, is, is really very interesting dynamic that we'll probably see more of. So that's the first condition. The second condition is that we have good government, um, good policy making and enforcement of laws. Um, and by, that's really not a given at all. There's some very bad governments around and there's some better ones. And uh, it's far from clear that we have the governments we need to step up. Um, so that's another whole debate from whether we have the business. But it, if we don't have kind of good government, um, good lawmaking, good law enforcement, we certainly won't see business stepping up in the way that it could or should. So I think that's the second one. I won't say much more about that. But just one sort of example of that is let's take just something really simple like minimum wage enforcement. Uh, you've got minimum wage regulation and laws in lots of countries and it's just flouted. And, and, and so that creates obviously a, a bad environment in which businesses feel that they're being undercut by others that aren't sort of playing the game fairly. And, you know, that they, these sort of things absolutely require proper enforcement um, so that uh, enlightened business can flourish. So the third um, condition is civil society engagement with business. I think civil society has played a really interesting role in the last two decades um, in nudging and holding accountable and making transparent business behavior. And I think there's been a big shift where NGOs typically used to just nag governments, and now they nag companies just as much as they nag governments, and quite rightly too, um, because businesses have a role and responsibility in helping to solve the, the many challenges set out in the SDGs. Um, so there's some really interesting um, new types of NGOs, digitally driven. Um, Avaz is an interesting example, but there's kind of um, 350.org is an interesting example, been doing amazing work to challenge business and finance on climate change. And there's some old players who are still really good, Oxfam, Greenpeace and so on. Um, so I, I think that that's an important part of the ecosystem. But the, the main thing I wanted to emphasize, which is the sort of field that I work on, is the role of investors, institutional investors. Um, because I, and, and Peter alluded to the fact that there are still incredibly mixed signals coming out of the investment sector. Um, and there's still a lot of fear and greed um, that motivates people that make decisions in the investment sector. But investors, institutional investors, in the last sort of four decades have risen um, enormously in terms of importance um, 
and uh, in the role of capital allocators and capital stewards. So capital allocators, by that I mean just mean the decisions that are made to you know, allocate money to um, one region of the world versus another in your um, pension portfolio, for example, or into one sector versus another. How much exposure do you want to um, fossil fuel energy versus how much exposure do you want to um, green energy? These are questions that institutional investors are constantly thinking about whilst trying to optimise um, returns over the long term. So that's what I mean by capital allocation. By capital stewardship, I mean that investors in companies, particularly equity investors, but bond investors have influence too, but equity investors have voting power, have influence, have access to boards and senior decision makers and companies. And the signals they send, particularly around this agenda, are really important. And I, I think it's really, I'm not, I do engage a lot with the, with the, with the corporate community, but less uh, than Peter, but I engage a lot with the investment sector. And I would say there too, something is shifting. Um, Having worked in this area of responsible investment, you know, nagging big pension funds and asset managers to be more engaged with sustainability for a really long, long period, it's kind of a moment of arrival, at least around that being acknowledged. Um, but <laughs> to Lutfi's point, there's a huge amount of nonsense marketing and blather um, in the space of the you know, responsible investment field. And everybody, I mean, let me give you one quite specific example. So one of the pieces of research that my organisation, Share Action, is doing at the moment is a big analysis of the 75 largest fund managers globally. And we will publish shortly a ranking of these fund managers. Uh, and uh, these rankings are usually quite constructive in kind of nudging a bit of a debate. But every single one of the 75 are signatories to something called the Principles for Responsible Investment. So they're all card-carrying responsible investors on paper. But the reality is they're amazingly different and varied in terms of their actual engagement with driving sustainability, thinking into the heart of their investment decision-making process, into the centre of the dialogue they have with big companies, big company boards and, 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 and CEOs. Um, so I, I, I want to emphasise that whilst there's talk of stakeholder capitalism, and I welcome the business roundtable statement, the reality is that shareholders still do have a kind of absolutely central, critical and influential role. They are the ones that can vote directors on and off the boards of companies. They are the ones that can... Um, propose resolutions at company AGMs and help to create policy. And really, um, they have votes on executive remuneration, which is a really important role in designing incentives in business. So they do actually have a kind of central role, much as people might like to think that all stakeholders are important, all stakeholders are important, but shareholders, let's not be under any illusions, are kind of the most uh, powerful on paper of all the kind of different stakeholders that companies have and they can use and abuse or they can accelerate and support um, the, the journey that companies go uh, on um, on this agenda so I'm just going to finish with a little bit of an anecdote around this work that I'm doing um, at the moment on Barclays Bank so uh, Barclays Bank uh, I imagine a number of you are customers. I'm, I'm not a customer, as it happens, but um, uh, I am a shareholder in Barclays, uh, along with a whole lot of other people who banded together to, to, to file a shareholder resolution just before Christmas. Um, under the UK Companies Act, um, shareholders can get together and put forward an idea to the company's uh, management and board and to the rest of the shareholder base and in this instance the shareholder resolution that we have proposed is that Barclays should phase out financing of fossil fuel companies and energy companies who don't have a plan that's aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. So Barclays is the biggest um, banking entity in Europe financing the fossil fuel sector, um, the sixth biggest in the world and uh, a lot of, there's a really interesting and flourishing debate, particularly in the European banking sector, less in the US banking sector um, uh, or the Asian banking sector, about the role that banks must play in financing and supporting a rapid decarbonisation of the economy. So we've put this to um, 
Barclays, and uh, it's, it's a really live situation. I'm, I'm in dialogue with Barclays Board about this and have a number of meetings with the chairman, and I don't know what they're going to do, uh, so I'm not really spilling any secrets. Um, but what's really interesting is that yesterday there was a report in the FT of a pension fund called Nest. Has anyone heard of Nest? Yeah, they're, they're a pension fund in the UK that was established a few years ago, and they have nine million members. Most of those members are actually very low-income people in the UK that have been automatically enrolled into pension provision. And Nest, which is a kind of a government-backed investment entity, is um, growing by half a billion a month in terms of its asset pool. It's the fastest growing investment entity in the world. Um, not surprising when you think about all of the, every, you know, nine million people once a month, something's going out of their paycheck into Nest. And Nest is adopting this very progressive approach to its kind of investment portfolio. And uh, it's written a really pretty feisty letter to the Barclays board saying, we think <clears throat> that you should back this resolution, we'll be voting for it, and we'd actually like you to recommend it to global shareholders. So what you see is a pension fund that really represents very modest earning people um, taking a really progressive position, driven by their idea of their <clears throat> responsibility to act in those people's best interest, to invest in a way that really embraces the SDGs and the sustainable um, and, and the climate agenda. So I, I think that's, I don't know where it'll go. I don't know where we'll end up, Barclays, but I think that's an example of the type of enlightened, engaged, and pretty proactive investment behavior that we need to see if we're gonna in any way see business rise to the challenge. Terrific, thank you, thank you, Catherine. We love examples. The more we, we get them, the better. Uh, it's a bit awkward for me, because I was going to um, very proudly say that LSE has recently become a signatory to the PRI. Uh, so I sit on the investment committee and, and we you know, very proudly signed up to that fairly recently. But Catherine's been telling me that it's almost outdated now that, you know, it was, Still good. Still it good. was the gold standard in its day. Uh, we now have the principles of responsible banking, which Barclays is a signatory to. So I really think you're pushing on an open door. At some point, they'll have to. It's going there. OK, speaking of banking. Julie Hudson. Julie is a former colleague. We used to work together at UBS. Uh, Julie Hudson is UBS Investment Bank's global head of ESG research. Uh, last year, she completed 25 years uh, at UBS. <laughs> and this year is the 15th anniversary, next month will be the 15th anniversary, of her team's first publication called Why Try to Quantify the Unquantifiable? which was about, I guess, ESG considerations. If you imagine the anatomy of an investment bank, you have sector-based analysts, and they're all looking at their respective sectors, looking at the mainstream metrics, and then you have Julie and her team sort of weaving through and, and getting them to also look at the wider issues because they, they just make sense. So highly pioneering uh, 15 years ago. Um, I saw recently that Julia's written a book on, on theatre, which I'm not really aware of, but I do remember the book that she co-authored, From Red to Green. How long ago was that? That was 2011. 2011. I distinctly remember that because of the way she framed the environmental crisis as an analogue to the credit crisis, the credit crunch that we've just seen, and expressing uh, how we live uh, almost in the same way as you would... Uh, describe somebody living on a credit card. So it's something like, I think, you know, we live within our means uh, by June and July, and from August onwards, we're starting to borrow from future generations. And that framing was terrific, and again, you know, very pioneering at that time. So, uh, Julie, over to you. Okay, and certainly credit where credit's due. Uh, Paul Donovan and I were using um, a very well-known chart of the Global Footprint Network which describes how many planets uh, human beings are using up each year in terms of consuming uh, renewable resources far more quickly than we can afford. And Paul is the economist in the writing team, and therefore uh, it was actually his idea, I have to say, wanted to frame this as the idea of an environmental credit crunch. Mm. And I thought that was a fabulous idea, so we wrote the, the book together. And I'll perhaps go a little bit further back and recount how I happened to start working in this field of 
ESG and sustainable investing. And it was because in my early years, when I was learning all about markets and finance, I just found the whole thing really puzzling. Because on the one hand, everybody was teaching me about the efficient market hypothesis and the capital asset pricing model. And you learned all about the Chicago School of Economics and how an efficient economy would allocate resources in an efficient way. And yet, periodically, you would get these quite spectacular uh, crashes in markets and you would get market failures. And I just kept walking around thinking, OK, so why do markets fail, right? If they're so perfect and if they're so inefficient, why do they fail? And I did a whole lot of different things. I was being teased about having a number of degrees as we came into the room. And it's because I thought, OK, well, I'm going to do a master's degree because that's a way of learning something really quickly. So I did a master's in financial economics and I thought, no, it's not there. And I did an MBA and I thought, no, I still haven't found it. I still don't understand why markets fail. And then I found um, a master's in economic regulation and competition. And I thought, now I'm beginning to understand this. And it's basically because business, markets, society are all trying to move forward. And you have these sort of negotiations that go on whenever there are externalized costs. And that's when I really began to get into this and understand it. And then in 2006, the CFA Institute asked if I'd write a monograph for the foundation, and I did. And the punchline, really, was the responsibility of the investment profession, which is the title of the monograph, is to decide when markets will fail and when markets can deliver. Because there are times when markets do a fabulous job of bringing capital to where it's needed and delivering, delivering the goods and services and benefits that society needs. But there are also times when markets do a very bad job of that. And moving on from that, uh, I guess the next important thing I read was really the work of Donella Meadows, who was part of that uh, Club of Rome team that wrote all about um, limit, growth without limits without growth, or growth, without li growth within limits. And Donella Meadows did a, wrote a primer called about systems thinking, which is, of course, this is a very good place in which to think about systems thinking. And because of her, I now look at everything as a kind of ecosystem. And I do this because, and I'm going to take a slightly different tack to the previous speaker, markets are astonishing. I've always been very interested in them and loved them, and it doesn't matter whether it's the fruit market on the weekend or whether it's um, securities markets during the week. I think they're quite amazing in terms of being able to bring people together and needs together and to move capital very efficiently. So I thought, okay, if you think about markets as ecosystems, well, they're just like any other system. So you have natural ecosystems, human ecosystems, societal ecosystems, market ecosystems. And sometimes you get feedback loops that are very constructive, and sometimes you get very destructive ones. And anybody who is uh, working in markets on a day-to-day -day basis knows what it's like when one of those feedback loops gets hold of you and either takes your portfolio off in an amazing way and you outperform, or it takes it off down in the other direction and you crash. And of course, within that at the same time, companies are delivering innovations to, driven by markets which allow you to get somewhere. So we recently, re recently wrote a piece in response to a piece of science that talked about the potential cascade of tipping points, which I found a really frightening article. I don't know if anybody else has read it. Basically arguing that climate science has got to the point where it's clear that a number of these different systems so whether it's the temperature or what's happening to um, sea ice or what's happening to the sea and uh, the increasing acidity of the oceans and what's happening to uh, food systems and land systems, the danger they highlighted is there could be a cascade of tipping points where everything goes in a very adverse direction all at the same time and becomes impossible to stop. And we stepped back from that and said, well, that is really frightening. What can we do about it? What can markets do about it? Markets are capable of delivering a cascade of tipping points. And if you got enough innovations, so the sort of thing you were just talking about in technology, and you, they were happening all at the same time, you could actually create a system going in the opposite direction. And 
So how does one do that? So every day I watch the market and I listen to what UBS analysts are publishing. And in 2014, I went across to the States and all of my clients were talking about fossil fuel exclusion, disinvestment. And I came back and there was an amazing piece of research from three UBS sector teams, uh, the autos, materials, chemicals teams, Ever since then, I have called it the energy revolution note. And what they described was really a prototype for fossil fuel free car travel. At a time when people are still laughing at the idea that the combustion engine can go obsolete. And since then, the same teams have written something called the electric vehicle teardown. And what they literally did was to work with a, a group of data scientists within my firm called UBS Evidence Lab. They took apart a Chevy Bolt a couple of years ago, because they wanted to see what was in it and what it would cost for an EV to be deliverable and affordable. And we were able to come up with a piece of research which said, basically, this has a real momentum behind it. Now, I'm not going to uh, be naive about this and say the electric vehicle is the solution to everything, because clearly it, it is not. So, for example, with the um, MIT uh, guys recently, every year we sponsor uh, the MIT Sustainability Summit, and one discussion in a mobility session around that was the fact that actually the market systems that are propelling things forwards in a very fast momentum way, of course they're propelling the innovation, which reduces CO2 emissions, but they're also propelling this tendency of human beings to consume. So if you go across to an electric vehicle, to an electric vehicle-driven system, but then you end up with more and more and more electric vehicles because everybody is in love with their car and wants to use their car as an office and does millions and millions more journeys, you end up where you started. You might have a clean car system, but you're still very resource intensive as an economy. And by the way, this was just really a, a sort of simulation in the discussion. So there are lots of things to fix there. And then, of course, I won't go on about things like there are batteries that are driving that system and you need to think about the supply chains and all of that. So that that's one instance where, yes, market innovation can drive things, but somebody needs to think about where we're trying to get, which connects into the idea of corporate purpose. So somebody needs to be thinking about what direction we're driving in so we don't go off a cliff. Um, second very example I'll just talk about is in a completely different sector. UBS analysts have recently written The Future of Food, one, two, and three, so three uh, blockbuster reports. And the second one was written by the chemicals team. And I went uh, together with one of the analysts, Andrew Sott, to do a presentation to clients. And I did the ESG introduction, and he talked about um, plant-based meat, which is helping to catalyze a reduction in meat eating. And he talked about gene editing, which is helping to produce more, produ more productive seeds. And by the way, gene editing is not like GMOs because universities own the IP and are selling it broadly, which means actually many will have access to that. But it wasn't that. It wasn't the innovations that were so mesmerizing in Andrew's presentation. The most exciting bit was a chart forecasting grain inventories. Now, you might think that was the most boring possible chart with nothing to do with ESG. So the base case forecast is for grain inventories to go up towards the top right-hand side of the chart. And Andrew's discussion was these innovations will reduce, well, basically will result in an ex a surplus of grain, which will produce a supply response, which will end up taking land out of the system. And the reason for that is the less meat you eat, the less grain you need, need with a multiplier, because it takes about seven times as much grain to produce the meat as it does if you just eat the grain. And I looked at that chart and thought that chart is actually about innovation, the power of innovation to produce these really positive, powerful feedback loops. Because by taking land out of the system, that's basically helping to contribute towards climate change goals. And it's relevant, of course, to the sustainable development goals. Even if those innovations were not put together with a particular goal in mind. So I think we need to, one thing to do, one more, to, to go across to the, the positives that uh, we're trying to get to, is to think about the fact that markets are actually a really powerful ecosystem that can deliver these ideas. 
participants basically need to have in mind that purpose and know where we're trying to get, know where the destination is, to recognise those ideas when they come through. Because, by the way, I've also just written a note to say that innovation and its impact on land use would not fit into the EU sustainable taxonomy. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Julie. And just to... Yeah, let's do that. Let's go around the floor. To just uh, uh, you know, put this into context, so UBS uh, as a group manages over a trillion dollars of assets under management. So when you get a research note of that kind that is revolutionary, that's ahead of its time, uh, even if a small percentage of uh, those assets are directed towards these themes, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great impact. It's a tremendous impact. Okay, now last but not least, our very own... Dr. Mary Martin. Um, Mary is uh, with LSE Ideas. She is director of the UN Business and Human Security Initiative. Um, I found it fascinating learning about uh, this particular niche that she works on, which is how do you crowd in private business in fragile and post-conflict situations? And they have a, a, a framework, a wonderful framework that um, assists in doing that because if it's not done correctly, you could very, very easily um, end up unraveling delicate peace situations and doing more harm than good. So you do need a well-considered, well-researched framework to go there, and that's one of the things that you do. Mary also has a new book. Uh, which is sitting over there. It's called Corporate Peace, How Global Business Shapes a Hostile World. So, ladies and gentlemen, Mary Martin. Thank you, Lutvi. I'm conscious I seem to have my back to some of you, so <laughs> this great format. Um, let me um, offer a, a couple of reflections, really, as a counterpoint to the really interesting um, remarks we've heard so far. Um, by starting going back a bit to think, what is the challenge that's implicit in this 2030 agenda and the sustainable um, development goals, and perhaps why it's so difficult, as Peter alluded to, that you know the businesses aren't making the progress, or, or perhaps they won't even make the progress. And. I mean, Peter's talked about, you know, Davos and the, the high peaks of finance and, and even Julie and Catherine are perhaps a perspective from the skyscrapers of, of London or New York. I'd like to offer you not the bird's eye view, but the worm's eye view, as we call it, how, how it looks from the ground. And something that, that Peter mentioned, which I think is, is critical in this, is the issue of trust and the image of business and the confidence that the rest of the world has that business can deliver on this. I think there are several types of challenge implicit in the SDG agenda. Two are in parallel. First, and you may find this surprising because my project is with the UN and it's called the UN Business and Human Security Initiative, but I have a real problem with the way the UN has and continues to its attitude towards the private sector. Um, the framework itself was, um, I was going to say an implicit, perhaps a very explicit attempt by the UN to co-opt the private sector as the financiers of last resort, if you like, um, for a very ambitious agenda. And Peter's given us some figures about how expensive that was. But if you go back before 20, uh, when this started, um, the, the SDG goals were set out, the predominant attitude um, of the UN and a lot of governments and policy towards the private sector was to see them as abusive, um, a global governance problem because of, of human rights uh, abuses. And suddenly there's a 180 degree switch, you know, we need their money. And, so I think um, for business, actually, the SDG uh, agenda is, is quite confusing. I think it's also confusing. It's all very well to talk about large uh, global companies, but for the, the vast mainstream of national 
less, less global leaders. Um, it's a forest of signaling about you know, what needs to be done, what they should do, how they should contribute, um, but actually a lack of concrete guidance on, on how to get there, um, both on the choice of goals, which is problematic. Um, lots of criticisms about businesses cherry-picking goals that suit them, and I'll come back to that. And just the methods for achieving um, the, the targets that are there. But clearly the fact that the global private sector has responded and has responded so positively, and it is really encouraging to hear what, what Peter and others are saying about the positive reaction, um, I think reflects the second challenge that, that um, my colleagues on the panel have, have also pointed to, this increasing public expectation and calls for a new kind of business model, model of, of capitalism. And that has multiple sources. It lies in the financial crash, um, the uh, environmental movement, plus also, it has to be said, the abuses that we continue to see, whether it's in terms of not paying taxes or on human rights or, or whatever. And as, as Catherine has, has um, pointed out very well, you know, it's the investors who are now driving this change also in, in public expectations urging a kind of um, social purpose to be in there. But in, if you like, uh, responding to that pivot, in making that pivot, um, the, the question is how, again. It's, it's not so much what, but it's how. Um, and I think there's a sort of fundamental, there's a conceptual question as well, which is that how businesses actually should see sustainability. You can have almost as many, clearly as many as, the, as there are uh, development goals and as many as there are targets, definitions of what sustainability means from environment to all kinds of other things. But I think the fundamental tension and dichotomy remains, is it something that is going to deliver uh, better costs, better profits for the business, or is it somehow that they need to max up on social philanthropy and corporate social responsibility? So I think this is quite confusing uh, for a lot of you know, smaller businesses as well as to what does this sustainability agenda mean. And I think what it does require is um, companies often moving into new and sometimes quite difficult new terrain and finding comfort zones in that. Um, I remember talking to a very large extractive multinational and he said, well, we know we mustn't abuse, we know we have to comply with certain standards and now we're being told that we should be development actors. Between that very broad spectrum, where do we want to be in, in that and, um, and how do we act? And I think that's a, a question that is still very relevant for a lot of uh, the private sector. I think in the area I work, which is uh, thinking about what business could do in fragile and conflict-affected <coughs> zones, um, if you take the example of SDG 16, which is the one on peace, justice, and strong institutions, <coughs> Um, it's probably a, quite a good example of where companies need to and can shift their horizons and find some new terrain. Um, SDG 16 has consistently, over the last sort of five years or more, been amongst the least popular SDGs. The take-up is something like 22 23%, compared with climate change, which is the most popular, where uptake levels are, I'm probably out of date, but sort of 65% or something or gender, or decent work, so eight and, um, uh, and um, uh, five, which one? Yeah, five, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, and the other ones that actually interestingly rank very low are um, uh, the one, the, the number two, which is on zero hunger, also uh, ones on life to do with life on land and life under the sea. And then they have the same levels of uptake as, as SDG 16, quite, quite poor. And I wonder why that is. Is it because they're seen as very vague? 
or perhaps it's just seen as the work not of the private sector, but it's something that governments um, really need to be <coughs> doing. Um, another um, reflection is that what we get told all the time by companies is, well, we don't work in fragile and conflict-affected um, zones. So SDG 16, it's not really relevant to us, for example. Um, if you take the World Bank definition of fragile and conflict affected, it covers huge swathes of markets where most, um, most large companies, certainly most um, uh, global companies, probably want to be. The World Bank definition is that it's um, where there are cycles of violence, weak governance and instability. And that probably covers Mexico, large parts of Latin America, South Asia and certainly Africa, where you know there are huge potential consumer markets, not to mention natural resources. But I think there are things that business can do um, uh, to reverse the trends, which see that by if we do nothing by 2035, 85 percent of the world's poorest people will be living in those zones as well. Um, and I think that is something that business has to pick up and, and act on, whether it's through SDG 16 or a combination of some of the other goals. I think going back to the point that there, there's still a lack of concrete guidance is that um, if you look at the guidance to business in conflict, uh, fragile and conflict affected zones, it has to do with um, human rights due diligence, it has to do with sort of do no harm. And it ignores um, a huge positive agenda that I think is emerging and that business um, can grasp. If you think about the targets within SDG 16, just as an example, it's things like uh, providing legal IDs um, to workers, it's protecting child workers, it's the non-discrimination of minorities. These are all kind of crossing points where business has something to say. And I think I would say that um, it's not, going back to my first point about this sort of ambiguous attitude of the UN and government to, to working with business, I think the point to recognise is that business has assets which are not just financial, they're not just a cash cow. They have attributes which include, there's a problem-solving mentality if you're in the private sector, which is incredibly useful. Um, they often the, the, the business cycle, the investment cycle, may actually be longer than the political cycle, if you think about three yearly, four yearly elections, which makes it very uh, valuable to have a business contribution. And I think, and the, the key point I want to make, which goes to my point about the worm's eye view, is that businesses, Large, very large, but also slightly smaller, are often the presence on the ground. They have local knowledge. They have um, a day-to-day -day interaction with the very people that these development goals are designed to benefit. And I think if I have one concern about uh, whether businesses can rise to this challenge, it is in the disconnect that we still see between the global rhetoric, which is really ramped up and is very welcome, um, and actually what companies do on the ground. And I think for that, what we need is for companies to really rethink their relations to communities, whether they're in the developed world, the underdeveloped world, in conflict-affected zones, all over, because the trust factor that was so undermined, has been so undermined over the last 10, 15, 20 years in particular, but really going back for a long time, all the time that businesses said the only business of business is business or to make profits. I think to rebuild that trust, to, to have a kind of uh, mutually reinforcing and, to kind of phrase, sustaining relationship with communities is what business now needs to do to really deliver on these goals. Thank you so much, Mary. So I'm going to... So we have about 20 minutes. Uh, I'm going to skip my questions. I'll come back to them if the, if the room runs dry. But uh, I'll go straight to questions from...
the floor. I'm going to um, try and be as scientific as possible without any uh, tools at my disposal. Uh, but I did see this hand here first. If you wouldn't mind uh, introducing yourself, please, and if you could direct the question to one panellist. We'll try and keep this as fast-paced as possible. Okay, thank you. I am Laura Trevino. I'm a student from the Master's Development Studies at LSE. I have a, a question. I would say anybody can answer it. Um, it's just about bringing these um, UN standard of the UN guiding principles in business and human rights, which was even adopted before the 2030 agenda. And I mean, SDGs are translated into human rights. So I would like to know your views of how the human rights due diligence that business are supposed to do according to this standard can serve on contributing to SDGs attainment. Uh, from the private sector. Anyone here would like to volunteer to answer that? Mary? Should I take that one? Thank you, Laura. Yeah, I think, um, I think these are um, essential preliminary stepping stones. I mean, the, the, the UNGP system isn't, um, isn't perfect, but I think, for me, I've been working on this sort of stuff for about... Um, 15 years now and that marked a real breakthrough in kind of public awareness and and with a framework that that serves as it but i would say that we're now we're accelerating way beyond that so human rights due diligence and the ungps are a basic minimum but we can go so much further than that and the positive agenda that I was mentioning that's why we we focus on what we call human security human rights is an essential part of human security but I think you know it can be so much more and I think the advantage of something like human security which I mean is a UN term but let's call it well-being or, or you know human development I think is that it shouldn't just be seen as compliance which human rights often is with companies having their backs against the wall, I've got to tick this box. I think we want to shift that mindset to imagining how business and society and communities can be co-constructors of a sustainable future. Thank you. Next question from this side. Uh, the gentleman over there. Hi. Um, so I'm Bennett Clemmer. I'm a consultant at Jones Lang with Sal. Um, you mentioned the cascades and the feedback loop effect, uh, which I think are wonderfully depicted in David Wallace Wells' The Uninhabitable Earth. Um, if we do hit this tipping point, uh, we will reach a point where all of the sustainable de development goals are unreachable. Now, do you think we need to prioritise focusing on reducing uh, greenhouse emissions and global warming? Anyone in particular would like to answer this? Uh, I mean, it's open. It's an open question, so... Julie or Peter, who would like to... Julie? Uh, you mentioned cascades, so it's yours. Exactly, and I was thinking about climate change. Yeah. And very clearly, that is that must be a hugely important and priority issue for absolutely everybody. Uh, you're quite right that we can't afford to go down that pathway of uh, you know, climate change, uh, the climate change cascade of tipping points. We need to try and offset that in some way through um, basically different, a different culture and different behaviours, societally speaking, in which there's less of a, a culture of consuming and consuming without really thinking about it. And I mean, the, the SDGs themselves are actually also a, a system, so you can't really pick one goal and try and meet that. So, for example, if you try and get, meet goal number seven, which is about clean energy, of course, it's also about clean, affordable energy, so unless what you're doing also supports um, decent jobs, a decent place to live, a decent infrastructure that can deliver the energy, you're not getting there. And of course, decent energy, clean energy would mean low carbon energy delivered in a system that is also low carbon and resource efficient. So it's, uh, when you ask a great question because it's a very, it's a complicated problem, but I think you're absolutely right. Um. Sorry, Peter, you wanted to come well, in? I think, I, know, I just think Julie answered it very well. So I, um, the only thing I would add is I do think, so it is a systems issue and it can't be solved simply by prioritising one part of the system. But I do think that climate um, 
is a primus inter pare, you know, is a first amongst equals um, topic that, that does deserve, um, you know, what do you say, more, but certainly an incredible focus as a Rosetta Stone issue, if you like. Um, I think one of the reasons, it's an interesting point you made about the uptake of SDGs, you mm. know, about climate change versus the mm. other, other themes. I do think that climate, relative to all of the other issues, is something that actually took the uptake should be 100%. Actually, because it is one of those issues that does cut across all sectors. If you look at the other 17 and you cut down to the next 163, not every issue does touch every industry and every sector material or every company's footprint, whereas carbon and climate change does. And so I think, you know, given the materiality of the issue to humanity and the materiality across industries, mm. it, you know, it really should be at 100% uptake, not at 65%. Yeah, I agree. Right. Oh. Yeah. around ethical and sustainable. Thank you. Um, ethical and sustainable supply chains. So Mary touched on the point of uh, building trust with the communities. And that means, so we're seeing a lot of pressure from investors and consumers for visibility across supply chains and across companies' operations. And we have the technology today to enable that visibility. So blockchain through tracking and traceability. But if companies were to take on blockchain, that means more public disclosure of their operations. That means open and fluid value networks, which stands in stark opposition to any strategic behaviors we've seen to date. To date. So sort of trying to gain competitive advantage. In your conversations with C-suites, are they ready for that openness and vulnerability? Um. I don't know if I'm allowed to use this quote because it's being recorded, but one, one CEO of a retailer I was with recently, I uh, thought, put it brilliantly, which was that um, on ethical supply chains, responsible business issues in the supply chain, sustainability, more from an environmental perspective, he said, what you have to think of is that um, the, the sustainability and responsible business pressures are crashing into waves of digital development and transparency and technology. And what he said was, you don't get a choice, right? In three to five years, you're going to be naked. And if you're going to be naked, you better be buff, right? <laughs> which, is, which is, I'm not sure if I'll answer that. But the idea from a responsible sustainability perspective is you should be making sure you, you, you have to assume radical transparency from now on. You have to assume that, and it's, look, by the way, it is radically transparent. I can show you systems that we have to go and scrape social data to look at any supply chain, we can pinpoint human rights abuses in an individual factory, in an individual country, in an individual, you know, it is already transparent. You know, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed as the, as the phrase goes, right? Um, and so that radical transparency is here, it'll just be that it becomes more and more the case. So to some extent, I think they do get it. Um, I don't think anyone questions it. I think the question is often about pace and scale. Um, but I think you get less people resist it these days. I think just, I just wanted to come back to something. I think the, I think it, 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 this, this issue of the climate point that you made, I think it's very interesting. I think if you are from the CEO study, from the UN CEO study, the two issues that came back from CEOs were climate um, and inequality over anything else mm. by a long, long way. As in, and I think those speak to the fragile nature of capitalism plus the technology situation plus the SDGs. Right? Because to your point about jobs and, and, and you know, economic development and all the things we need from an economy, if you don't have both of those two things, actually the system can just disintegrate either way. Mm -hmm. So I think you have both of those um, in, in that, in that con you know, they'll probably the two issues, at least in the perception of CEOs, are the most important to tackle and that we haven't tackled and that there's a lack of trust in the system because it has delivered over 40 years, if you look at the US, the UK, since Reaganomics, you know, look at the average, you know, the average increase for the average working class family in terms of wages and so on and so forth, quality of jobs, etc. So you can't, it's, it's one of those two things, you, either of those two could destabilise the system if we don't find a way to, to bring them together. And I think that happens in a world where you have multiple different forms of disruptive technologies, but there are three that are also primus inter pare. I think the point, you know, there's a series of low carbon technologies, electric vehicles and, and, the, you know, and clean energy is one. But I think if you look at artificial intelligence, um, 
And then you look at genomics and, and mapping, you know, the, everything on Earth, everything and you know, every living thing. <laughs> you take it's an extraordinary time where we could see it rapidly spiral out of control, even on top of all the climate feedbacks, which is based on the systemic issues I've just mentioned there, or they could be the solution to the problems that we face. And that's the point about the technology point that I just go back to, is that we have to focus on those three or four different technology themes and find ways of arcing the curve of their trajectory and how we invest in those, how we build the guardrails around them, how we um, work on those as societal, you know, different players in society. Um, or I don't believe business will rise to the challenge. I personally, I maybe this is a bit controversial, unless we can harness those technologies in the next 10 years to deliver sustainable development, those three I've just mentioned, I don't think we'll do it. But if people want to tweet that quote, I think it might actually make uh, <laughs> people more. So over here, sir. Yes, thanks for that most encouraging <laughs> delivery by the, the, those in the front line. We went to the speakers. But mine is a, an open question regarding a number of issues in terms of s systemic issues. For instance, the World Economic Forum mentioned UN and NGOs and transnational corporations, for instance. The rent, my main issue is the question of mismanaging the global economy, as we've had over two, 280 years of capitalism. And one speaker mentioned the challenge and a new type of capitalism to, to somehow evolve post fourth industrial revolution. In your experience, can we still, as a global family, leave everything to the market and wait for some kind of nirvana to, to evolve as a result? Or have we reached a crossing point, a new, not merely a new type of capitalism, but a new world order in terms of people first? Thank you. And capital setting the agendas. Great question, Catherine. <laughs> That's a daunting, daunting question, um, although a really interesting one. Well, I, I just wanted to link it back to what Peter said about um, climate and inequality being the two things that business leaders threw up most, because I think that's really interesting, because I think embedded in the model of capitalism that we're all still part of is kind of the production of externalities, which are really dangerous, and climate change is all about that, and embedded in the version of capitalism we have today is that inequality just gets bigger and bigger because the returns to capital are much higher than the returns to labour. So if you've got capital, you just keep acquiring and building and you get richer and richer. And So it's absolutely valid to ask, hold on, should we be looking to this system to solve all, the, all these problems? Um, and I, 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 I grapple with this the whole time at Chair Action. Um, and I think that um, ultimately probably no. Um, and I think we're probably going to have some really ugly shakeouts um, and crises that will kind of create political will and interest for more radical solutions that probably are going to be needed. At the same time, it's very encouraging that people in business and people in investment are really concerned about these questions about you know what's being produced as a byproduct negatively of of the way they go about things and i want to just come back to this word that i think julie mentioned which is purpose mm, i jotted that down too i i think that's at the moment the purpose of business but this is very fundamentally under assault at the moment is just to make money um and so all this you know, magnificent innovation, technology, it needs to be harnessed to a higher purpose that somehow society needs to define. And each company needs to define for itself. Um, and we're kind of, that's a debate at the moment, but still not the kind of lived reality of, of what goes on day to day in business. And there are just huge incentives in terms of people's careers, in terms of you know, people's access to capital. Um, in business to just pursue profitability um, above all and any other purpose. And, and so I think somehow we, we, we really need to, and, and you know, it's really interesting that Larry Fink, who is the CEO of the world's largest fund manager, not a company that I love or admire particularly, and in fact, my, my organization spends quite a bit of time, you know, poking them for um, 
and challenging them on certain hypocritical statements, but it's nevertheless a great sign of the times sure. that the CEO of that company feels the need to send a letter to the CEOs of all of the companies in his portfolios, in the portfolios of that company, which is basically every large company in the world, asking them to define their purpose in a higher, you know, in a bigger frame than just profitability. So the, the kind of the signs are there, but you're so right to challenge and question whether these entities are really capable of reinventing themselves, and, and I don't know. Yeah, and it might be, I mean, I think, that's, I think that's the perfect way of reconciling the two points, which is, to your point, purpose, and your point, I think, was, if I've read it, if I jotted it down right, that it's that at the moment we have markets that are working but are not necessarily grounded in purpose and not an active discussion about what their purpose is, which is, I think, what you said. And I think, you know, so there's markets in a vacuum, almost, right? markets for the sake of markets. And I think if you take that purpose piece in capitalism, um, I think that's what it will have to look like, whether it's called capitalism or, you know, actually capital, there are three types of capital, physical capital, human capital, and financial capital. If anything, probably in the next iteration of capitalism, we may want to, we may want to, to rebalance that to be far more focused on the human capital and the physical capital and what we've done to it, rather than the financial capital and what the potential is of the natural environment as the physical capital, <laughs> human capital as people. Um, so I think, you know, I think that, there's a lot to that, that statement about purpose and markets and purpose, because I do think it is by far the least worst and most durable way of organising society that we have found so far in recent decades. Mm -hmm. But it is not delivering on the challenges that society faces. Um, again, it's sort of come, can it rise? Take out can businesses. Can capitalism rise to the challenge? I think yes, but it'll have to be massively rebalanced um, towards delivering on this purpose that we talked about. And it might just be worth throwing into the pot the whole uh, design of economics and GDP measurement. I was sure. very interested in For your sure. comment that we have all these innovations going on in technology and yet GDP has just been kind of bubbling yeah, along. we don't measure it properly, yeah. But actually, are we measuring the right thing? No, and if you had a cultural change so that what so that you measure what really matters in terms of what's being produced within the economy, might you then have a change yeah, a in point. corporate culture? Yep. Um, I need to ask somebody who's a, a student or an affili affiliate with the LSC over here, amongst the people who want to ask a question. Please. Hi, I'm Margarita. I work for LSE Ideas as well as for Amnesty International UK as a research for business and human rights. And I think it was great that all the panellists seem to agree that businesses need to be at the centre of the trying to achieve the development goals. At the same time, I feel like at the higher levels, the mindset is still very much state-centred. So, for example, states that need to report to the UN about the SDGs or like level of achievement and more generally translating the SDGs in human rights, businesses are not uh, being held accountable under international law for human rights violations. So how do you think it's possible to translate sort of like this state, very much state-centered mindset into something that actually puts businesses at the fore or civil society in general actually? Is it something that can be done top-down or should, does it need to be bottom-up? I mean, the, the only thing I'll say, so I don't I don't know. I think that, that issue I mentioned about businesses being very nervous about political uncertainty in the next three to five years and the apparent undermining of multilateralism by some of the big forces in, in, in you know, big, biggest actors that you talk about um, you know, means that we may not have a choice from a top-down perspective. And I think there is a growing realisation, and I really, you know, really having those conversations behind closed doors, which says, we've got 10 years to fix this. Um, if you wait, wait around for governments to fix this, you can forget it, right? Um, and it'll be on our watch as CEOs. So I think there are a number of CEOs. I'm not saying it's across the board. I'm not saying there aren't still examples of companies that are still trying to, um, you know, arbitrage the system and are trying to make you know everything they can out of it. But there are a group of the very biggest CEOs that, if these societies collapse, you know, and if these systems collapse, what business are you going to do? Right. If you're the biggest industry player and you're, you know, in, in, take the, the, the sort of main 20, 30 industries in the world, if you know, the world is falling apart around you, what, what business are you doing? What growth are you going to drive? What benefit are you? And I think, um, you know, I think we have talked about it a little bit. I think 
you know, this is this is also for a lot of you, you know, who are coming through as as the next generation of leaders. And you mentioned this, Catherine. That, you know, that we need another generation of leaders and a different type of leaders than we've had before. You know, I think this is something that you're going to have to be able to help us square the circle with, with different skills, different mindsets, different attitudes. Um, I think that's starting to take hold already. Uh, amongst existing leaders, recognising that they have not necessarily the right knowledge, skills, attitudes, mindsets to solve some of these problems. But I think a lot of you can bring some of that problem-solving mentality to bear and try and look, work out how we square the circle on some of these issues. And I will say one of the, the biggest surprises for me out of the CEO study uh, this time round was the number of CEOs. And I'm going to say, on a, I've never, I haven't looked at it exactly, but we, I did, 100, we did 121 one-to-ones, and I did 80 of those, and I would say around 50% of those at some point mentioned their children um, putting pressure on them as CEOs, um, and I've never heard that before, <clears throat> never. Right? I mean, you're talking like one or two in the average, because I've done that study every three years since 2006, um, and this is the first time. So don't forget, you know, if your mums and dads are in important positions, um, you know, <laughs> give, give them a bloody hard time. <laughs> so I'm getting dagger eyes from people all over. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, but we are breaking for drinks outside, and, and uh, please do... Uh, approach members of the panel with the questions. Um, if you'd like to drop me an email, if you're still unable to get your question through and would like to drop me an email, I'll try and get an answer back to you if I can. Uh, but I think for now we should uh, we should wrap it up. But, but the one other thing as we oh, go into... That's right. So two other things. Um, there are five people who asked questions and there are five Kindles, so please come and grab me afterwards yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and you can get your Kindles. If I could also and point I should out... say that they're also... The reason they're Kindles, so the book is published next week, it's not in hard copy, but from a circular economy perspective, you can get a 1,000 books on a Kindle. You'll find that the cover is recovered and recycled clothing and bottles and so on. So it's supposed to be a, a more circular use of materials for delivering books. Great. And... Uh, and one last thing, we have, I just saw sitting over there, Paul Smith, the recently retired CEO and president of CFA Institute. Paul came to LSE to deliver a talk um, of, you know, in another part of LSE and very kindly uh, came to join us immediately afterwards. He'll be joining us for drinks outside. So please do direct some of his questions uh, to him as well. Paul, welcome. <laughs> and, uh, and with that... Uh, Let's just say uh, thank you to the panel as well and uh, hope to see you all outside. Thank you very much. Thank you.